Hi, my name's Hank Greeley. I'm a professor here and director of our Center for Law and Biosciences. If you're interested in the Law Center for Law and Biosciences and you don't know much about it, we have two different URLs. The top one, cleverly named Node, for some reason I don't understand, mm -hmm. is the website for the center itself. The second one is the website for our CLB blog, which I hope you'll check out. And the third is an email address that will reach us at the Center for Law and Biosciences. Um, today, uh, first, I want to apologize to all of you who aren't here, but are listening or will be watching at some point in the future as this is being taped. Two o'clock on a weekday afternoon is not, shall we say, the optimal time for running an event at least at a law school, since most of the school is not only in class, but those who aren't in class are attending our dean's town hall meeting. However, our speaker today is only here for another couple weeks this time, and as he and I were comparing notes, trying to find either a lunchtime or a late afternoon event when we could both do it, the answer was, I think, 2015. Yeah, something like that. At least it wasn't this time through. So. We apologize for the odd time. Uh, all I can say is it's better than the alternative, which would be not to have him do this event. And that is an alternative not to be contemplated because Richard Epstein is, I don't know, I'm trying to look for the right word, a uh, force of nature, a famous law professor. I think he probably holds the record, though I haven't looked at this, for the most different law school classes taught by anyone, since you've Probably. taught just about every first year course there is known to man Probably. or woman. Um, Richard has uh, been a law professor since 1968. His first five years were at the University of Southern California. His next 37 or so were at the University of Chicago, from which he moved a few years ago to NYU. He is also famous. He's famous for being uh, prolific. He's famous for his libertarian views. He's famous for uh, his prolificness is kind of cheating because he talks twice as fast as anybody else, so he gets out twice as much stuff. And he is, in some circles, famous as the most successful dean ever of the University of Chicago, an interim position which you held for four months. And nine days. And didn't screw up anything. <laughs> and so with that strong endorsement, let me turn the microphone over to Richard Epstein to talk about off-label use, the First Amendment, and the FDA. Oh, thank you, Hank. Um, it's a great pleasure to be here. I am sorry that we couldn't do this at high traffic time, but immortality beckons to us all through the video system. So um, even I now, I'm a Twitterer, and I tweet from time to time, so uh, this thing will have a larger uh, audience. And the topic is, what is the FDA off-label uses in the First Amendment in any particular order? And you know, I, when I'm coming to an audience where I don't know how many people know what, let me just see if I could start a little bit at the beginning and then sort of work into what was a fairly important criminal prosecution that was upended in the Second Circuit decision that came down in December, which I think most people regard as highly cert-worthy on the one hand, and if it is sustained, will wreak a genuine revolution in the way in which drugs will be sold and disseminated and published or used in the United States. Well, I think if we're going to take these three things, we ought to take them in order historically. And the first of them is, of course, the FDA. And the FDA performs many useful functions that I don't wish to talk about here, particularly those which have to do with policing branded and with policing safety issues, which are extremely important. For those of you who don't follow this particular field, misbranded drugs and counterfeit drugs are a major problem inside the United States. And I think virtually everybody believes that it's a legitimate government function to counter that, and it requires extensible levels of industry cooperation uh, with the government. The, that's the pure part of this thing. But in starting in first 1938 and then 1962, uh, the FDA expanded its ambitions. It became involved with safety. Originally, it was in a very tentative way. If somebody had a concern about the safety of a drug, they could raise it before it was released. The FDA had a short period of time in which you could do something. Otherwise, it went on the market. And there was relatively little constraints. Uh, but in 1962, they added effectiveness after the thalidomide situation and have progressively since that time tightened all the safety regulations. So that essentially what happens is that the FDA has a powerful monopoly position on the question as to whether or not any new therapeutic agent 
can be released for sale uh, to the general public. Uh, the FDA also has a mandatory warning type situation. And what that warning type situation essentially does is it gives it the option to compel certain kinds of warnings to be put on particular kinds of drugs, including black label warnings, which essentially are abandon hope or ye who enter here. You are in Dante's Inferno. This thing may help you, but it may kill you. Uh, beware of that. Beware of that positions when you prescribe it, and so forth. So you have those two particular elements. Now, there is a, an important element in both of them, which deals with the strength of the monopoly interest that the state has with respect to release and with respect to warnings. Taking the warning things first, it's very clear that the state cannot have a monopoly power over the warnings that are issued with respect to drugs, because nobody can prohibit any third party from coming in and deciding to issue warnings of its own about what is recommended or not recommended with respect to a drug. And the important thing to understand about this particular function is that the FDA warnings are, by any, I think, honest estimate, rather primitive in what they tell you and leave out all sorts of vital information which the private market has been able to supplement. And what I mean by the private market here is not so much the profit side of the private market, but the nonprofit professional associations, which essentially for every major discipline have voluntary groups which essentially update the kinds of information that are available about drugs. Uh, the difference between the FDA warnings on the one hand and the private warnings are very pronounced in many ways. The FDA tends to use warnings based upon its own clinical trials and its own internal estimations. They do not update them very frequently. When you start looking at private parties, what they do is they collect all the data from around the world, not just from their own clinical tests. They put it together. And what they then do is they consistently update these warnings so that they're much more current than the stuff that the FDA has. And in effect, they not only tell you what the FDA does, which is this drug is legal or not legal for this purpose or not purpose, they do other things as well. Most notably, they give you some very clear indications as to the sequence in which the drugs ought to be used. So that you take the standard treatments first, and then you go to more toxic and more risky treatments in second and tier, third tier situations. Uh, the private warnings also spend a great deal of time on drug interactions, which as physicians know are absolutely critical in the way in which you start to treat patients, whereas the FDA looks at the molecule in isolation and doesn't provide any information of that particular sort. The consequence of all of this is that for most practicing physicians, if you talk to them, uh, they regard the FDA warnings as boilerplate, tend not to take them very seriously. They regard the private warnings and indications as being extremely important, and particularly amongst you know, specialists, they update themselves periodically, every day, every week, or whatever it is, to take the variations in account. These organizations are to some extent competitive, so that you have six or seven groups that deal with various kinds of cancers. Their recommendations are not always consistent, so that somebody will often look at multiple places and then decide. And in addition, one of the huge advantages of the voluntary system over the FDA system is that what happens is as new information comes forward, you could just send it to a voluntary group and they'll say thank you. If you send it to the FDA and indicate a counterindication, counter they will investigate you. And they will require you to supply them with all the information so they can figure out what's going on. In consequence thereof, the FDA gets relatively little information. The private organizations get a great deal of information. And what we do is we have here a nice sort of situation in which there is a competitive competition between the organized market that is created through voluntary means and the government monopoly. And on the information side, it's hands down who tends to win that particular battle. There is, of course, also the question of release and use. And this is where the off-label stuff starts to become so important. In dealing with the FDA, there's a very long period in which you essentially have to go through clinical trials and beyond in order to persuade the FDA to release the thing to the market. And we know that the standards that they use are not the same that rational actors use in deciding whether or not they want to take a drug. And we know this for a very simple reason, which is for any drug which is not available on the market, there is a huge demand for special exceptions for experimental use in cases of extreme danger to particular individuals. The FDA is reluctant to do this because the test that they use is whether or not if you run two standard deviations, um, you can prove that it's significant. 
The test that people use in their own life has nothing to do with the 95% confidence issue. They are straight expected value maximizers. They ask the question is, given who I am and what the situation is, am I better off paying to buy this drug or better off doing something else? And if you think there's a very small chance of an improvement, you will take it in the experimental market if you can get to it, even though the FDA will not release the drug. So what happens is they're using very different decision type situations. And as you would predict, there are huge backlogs that take place of people who seek but are denied permissions to use experimental use. Because the FDA's view about this to some extent is we start allowing routine experimental uses. It chips away at our general kind of improvement or approval kinds of processes. So we have to ration these things out very carefully. Uh, there was one person named Abigail Burroughs who was constantly trying to get Herbitux. And sure enough, she finally got Pfizer and the FDA to approve. And the drug arrived six hours or something after she died. And her father was rather upset about all this and essentially has formed an operation known as Abigail Alliance. And the whole purpose of this is to basically speed the approval of drugs into the market. So at that end, the bottleneck really works. But at the other end, there is no bottleneck. What happens is once a drug is on the market, the FDA is in a position to determine the official warnings, which do not bind, but it cannot regulate the practice of medicine. And what that means, in effect, is that any physician who wants to, on the basis of any information they get from any collateral source, can decide to use various kinds of drugs for off-label uses. Uh, the empirics that go into making these off-label uses are not systematic double-blind clinical trials, as they are for standard situations. Essentially, what you would want to call it is a form of hunch and incremental empiricism. I don't mean that disparagingly. I actually think it's a very good method. You have a patient. Nothing seems to work. Joe down at the pharmacy said, you know, somebody else tried this on a tumor that wasn't too different from yours. Everything's helpless. Why don't you give it a shot? And you go to the patient, you tell them the situation, they say, well, better than nothing, and off you go. And if you make situations like that thousands upon thousands of times a year, you slowly develop this kind of body of information, uh, which is certainly not rigorously reliable, but nonetheless may be better than the next best thing. And the more people who go into the system and the more people you have processing it, the more reliable it's likely to be. So that what you do is you develop very systematic bodies of thought, none of which is systematically verified, all of which may be dangerous. But on average, people come back to it. And I think to this day, I'm not aware of a single study done on off-label uses in which somebody has tried to compare the safety of the off-label use of a drug with the safety of the drug with respect to its on-label use. Uh, we don't know what it is, but the basic guess is that it's about the same on the downside. And if you've got an improvement over the other stuff that's made available to you, uh, you find individuals and their physicians and these NCN groups doing this. Why do I think it's somewhat confident? If you actually look at the literature, you find two things. One is that all flavorable uses, as designed by physicians in this haphazard process, set the standard of care in medical malpractice cases. So you can be found guilty of malpractice if you don't engage in a dominant off-label use. And it turns out when you're doing reimbursement schedules through the uh, Medicare system on the one hand and through private health care systems on the other, generally reimbursement for off-label uses is going to be appropriate. This, of course, has to be the case in some level because when you're dealing particularly with cancer drugs, for which clinical trials are extremely difficult to organize, given the variability with respect to the tumors and the small numbers of populations involved, something somewhere between, you pick the numbers, 50 and 85 percent is a pretty good range, depending on drug and type of condition, uh, is the percentage of treatments which are done by off-label uses. So you have basically a gray market economy out there. And if the FDA were to try and say, look, off-label uses should be made illegal because we have so much confidence in our scientific method. There would be a palace rebellion of the first order. Now, you must understand that the palace rebellion would not be read by the cowardly pharmaceutical companies who are on the both sides of everything. They're afraid of retaliation on the one hand, and they're uneasy about new entrants on the other hand. So they tend to be bystanders in this game quite correctly from their point of view. It's the patient groups that drive all of this kind of work because they are perfectly unambiguous that more choices mean greater success. And they resent bitterly, I might add, the sort of uh, raging paternalism that they see in the FDA's efforts to coordinate these groups.
Now, the key issue, therefore, gets us to the First Amendment, is this. Who is it that can spread the gospel with respect to the off-label uses that are involved with these drugs? And the answer to that question has an unambiguous side and a very murky side. The unambiguous side is that anybody who is not part and parcel of the drug apparatus is entitled, as of right, to broadcast whatever information they want about these drugs and leave it for other people to evaluate as they see fit. But the one set of people who, according to the FDA, are not allowed to speak about these drugs are the companies that make them. It's not because they don't have any information about it, but the fear that the FDA has, and it's a legitimate fear, is that if somebody is in the position of being the manufacturer of a product and they endorse its particular use, there's a danger that they will oversell the good features of this drug and undersell the bad features of this drug. Now, if the FDA can figure this out, so can any physician and any particular patient. And so the question has always arisen, why don't you allow people to discount that information and to compare it against information that they get from independent sources? And if you believe that there's bias, it's still a risk. But if you believe that there's a fount of information inside the drug company that the private parties do not have, say because of some trade secret data that they present, keeping that stuff off the market may have a negative side, which in principle could outweigh the positive side. The drug companies are aware of all of this stuff, and what they have essentially adopted is a slightly different strategy. What they've tried to do is to have the right uh, to reproduce and to disseminate information that has been collected by others so that you don't have the bias in origination situation, but you can get greater spread of the information if they can spread it out. And there's no question that the information markets with respect to these drugs on the off-label market are, in fact, imperfect. Uh, some of the specialists know about it. The generalists may not. And if the generalist has a patient and they don't get it to a specialist in time, the lack of information can, in fact, be quite harmful. So what the drug companies would like to do in many cases is to resort to two lines. One, if there's an article in the AMA or the New England Journal of Medicine which talks about how a drug works in an off-label use, what they would like to do is to say, dear doctor, here is an article from the New England Journal of Medicine. Read it and make up your own mind. But that is considered by the FDA to be promotion under its current rules. And since you cannot promote in ways that they do not approve, you're now promoting for unauthorized uses. And so giving out accurate information about these things generated by independent parties is, according to the FDA, a criminal offense. I leave it for you to decide whether that is correct. The second thing, which is what gets involved in the Coronia case, is that what physicians do oftentimes is they go and they give public accounts to medical groups or to public groups about what they perceive to be the off-label benefits of particular drugs in a particular market. And the, this is an extremely difficult area to work in, and it's what happened in the case of uh, the Coronia situation. What happens is if, in fact, the person who gives this information is paid for or instructed by the drug company, which has made this thing, you could then argue that there is a conspiracy against the interest such that the doctor himself should be subject to criminal prosecution. And the same thing could be said with the detail man, that is the salesman, who take this thing around, who for a whole variety of reasons have to be highly educated in this particular field in order to be able to function. Because physicians aren't complete dummies. And if they hear some information that they know to be wrong, they will discount everything else that is being said by the same physician. I've actually sat in on one or two of these things in the course of my life. And I'm always amazed at how much they know and what kinds of questions are being asked. Uh, the received wisdom is that every doctor is a dupe and a pawn in the hands of the, front of the company. And so therefore, they cannot be trusted to assimilate this information. Paternalism runs not only to patients, it also runs to physicians in a very strong and I think rather dubious way. But the Coronia case involved a drug called Exacrum or something like that. It doesn't really matter. It was a drug made by a specialist company called Jazz Pharmaceutical these days. And it has to do with various kinds of disorders, neural disorders, sleep disorders, and so forth. And you don't need to know what the names of the disorders are, because I forget them as quickly as I pronounce them. Um, neuropathies of some quarter or another, who knows? But all you have to know is that there is a permitted use called X, 
and an unpermitted use called Y and another one called Z. And what happens is, in this particular case, they managed to send out a trapping agent who did not entrap, but simply gave the opportunity for somebody to do this. And they brought a prosecution against a doctor named Gleason, who unfortunately committed suicide because it was so difficult to handle the pressure of these investigations, and against one of these salesmen. And now the issue is, how can you protect yourself? If you're Richard Epstein, and you live in the world of before 1937, where freedom of contract and freedom of information is thought to be a constitutional value, what you would say is that you cannot make a conspiracy out of the sharing of information voluntarily amongst individuals, and that this would be treated as though it were an economic liberty, and the government can only suppress it if you could show that there was some use of either monopoly power, not an issue in these cases, or systematic forms of fraud or deception, not an issue in these cases. The year is now 2012, and nobody believes in economic liberties, but everybody believes in the First Amendment. And so what has happened is all the traditional arguments about economic liberties have, in these communication markets, migrated over to the First Amendment. And there is a decision called Central Hudson, which essentially announces the following kind of proposition, which is the only way you can regulate speech by commercial entities is to show that it is false and misleading, and then what you have to do is to narrowly tailor the remedy to the abuse in question so that you don't suppress too much speech. And as many of Sage Law Professor has noted, the modern First Amendment cases as they apply to commercial speech are very much like the traditional economic due process cases that were applied to other forms of economic activities and speech in an earlier year. This took some doing to do because back in the early 1940s, the Supreme Court issued a kind of preemptory statement to the fact that commercial speech is outside the scope of the First Amendment, essentially allowing the economic regulation that was given widespread validity to control in this particular area. But starting in the 1970s and moving forward, all of a sudden people started to distinguish between commercial speech and commercial speech to distinguish between advertisements on the one hand and the dissemination of information about product use and value and started to give greater protection for the latter. And in the Cremonia case, the basic argument that was made by the defendant in the criminal case was really quite simple. If anything that I said had been said by the doctor who gave the information to me, it would be protected speech under the First Amendment and the FDA, even if the statute would change, would not be in a position to block. Why is it that now that when the drug company says this information, we don't use exactly the same standard for it that we use for the independent party? Why do we now call this a conspiracy instead of a, basically a cooperative effort to produce positive information of value to consumers? And in fact, this is a serious intellectual problem more generally because there are good and bad words for collective operation. One of them would be community action, and the others would be conspiracies and restraint of trade. They exactly involve the same kind of voluntary and cooperative behavior. And how do you decide whether or not something is a conspiracy that ought to be punished, as opposed to a partnership or joint venture that ought to be excolded, is you have to know the direction of the externality that it creates. So if it turns out that 10 people get together in order to murder an 11th, the externality is negative. The gains to the parties increase the probability that this will happen. So you must punish the conspiracy to reduce the cooperative behavior in order to make sure that you don't have too many prosecutions for murder by virtue of the fact of having too many dead people on the street. But the externality with respect to this medical stuff is not the death of other individuals. It's their improvement of their life condition. It's a positive externality. And now gains from trade increase the likelihood that this positive externality will occur. And so what started out as being negative kinds of activities, the sign now flips because of the externality. And so therefore, it is the kind of behavior that is encouraged. And what is striking about this particular opinion, although it is not in the language of economic due process, Essentially, every standard argument that was made in favor of the economic liberties in the pre-1937 era is now recaptured, repackaged, and sent out as a form with respect to protected speech. So what is to be said then on the other side? Well, there was a dissent, 
uh, by Judge Deborah Ann Livingston, which essentially repeated the standard orthodoxy. And let me tell you before I open it up for any questions and discussion what that orthodoxy turns out to be. It is all forms of economic liberty are necessarily limited by uh, the need to make sure that the government can enforce its police power rights for the protection of the population at large. The police power means that the ordinary liberty that you have to buy and sell goods or to own and use property are necessarily limited in order to protect the health, the safety, the morals, and the general welfare of the public at large. And she said if you go back to earlier cases, most notable would be a case called Rutherford from the late 70s, uh, essentially the health issues associated with drugs are so powerful that the government applies a very, or the courts rather, apply a very low standard of review, i.e. rational basis, so that so long as you can prove that the issue is one that arises in a case where there could be some consumer misunderstanding or producer fraud, blanket regulation becomes perfectly appropriate. And they said that in the context of a drug called Laetrile, which as most people know had a rather seamy history associated with its use. Uh, when you start getting onto Herbitux, which was the drug that Abigail, ah, Abigail Burroughs wanted to take, it turned out that all the faculty members who treated her at Johns Hopkins Medical Center thought it was a rather good idea. Uh, the social organization of the networks was so much better by the time you got to 2000 from what it was in 1980, precisely because the need for this information developed an institutional response, that you're talking about totally different environments. And I have no doubt that back of all of these opinions lies the judgment that somehow or other the dissemination of information independent of the FDA is so much more reliable that the presumption in favor of government legitimacy simply because you're talking about a complicated product is no longer there. But to Judge Livingston, her attitude is, you know, if you do this, you're going to completely upset the system of drug regulation that has existed in the United States, not only since 1938, but maybe as far back as 1906. Forget about the hyperbole. Essentially, what she says is the First Amendment should not allow you to make a run around the police powers that we have widely respected in this particular area. There is no question that in terms of traditional doctrinal statement, she's probably closer to the truth than the others, at which point she and the majority get themselves into one of these senseless but important distinctions about what are you prosecuting this person for. And what she said is the prosecution is for a conspiracy to sell a drug without approval, and the fact that you have to use speech evidence is simply evidentiary with respect to one of the essential elements of the conspiracy. If you could punish the conspiracy, you must be able to prove it. And then you chin writing for the majority says, you know, you may say you're doing that, but you read this record, obviously you're punishing her for the speech as well. I have to say my mind is not subtle enough to figure out how it is that you can do one without doing the other. I think virtually all of these cases are dual. So I think that the correct answer is, I don't care which way they're using it. You're allowed to use extrinsic evidence to support intent in a conspiracy to murder case because the end result is itself one that's undesirable. And so therefore it's fine to use it because you don't mind punishing it as speech and you don't mind punishing it as evidence. But once you flip the sign of the externality so it's positive and not negative, then you mind punishing it whether you're using it as evidence or whether you're using it as speech. So my view is Rhett Butler's view. Frankly, my dear, I don't give a damn. Uh, which of the two sides of the line this thing happens to fall upon? It seems to me that the behavior has to be protected in individuals. And then just as a famous case called NAACP versus Alabama said, that if you're allowed essentially to work in the civil rights movement, you could combine with other individuals to do so. And if the government wants to find out who the members of your organizations are so it could harass them, well, we have a First Amendment right of association to stop that from happening. So I don't care about the doctrinal points. I care about the major message. So the issue that we have to face in the future is whether or not the First Amendment will get a foothold in this particular area. Of course, when it does, it will essentially end the stranglehold that the FDA has with respect to the production of some fraction of the information about these drugs. Companies will now be able to promote them and the only constraints against them will be the force and fraud or misleading behavior constraints, which are completely consistent with general libertarian ideals. 
So this is what you have, and this is in many other areas. The law is like giant tectonic plates moving in opposite directions. On the bottom, you have the tectonic plate, which says, you know, you're talking about health care, and your name is Mr. Obama, and you want to protect the PPACA, the Patient Protection and Affordable Care Act. Be my guest. We don't know anything about health care. We just decide whether it's constitutional. You decide whether it's wise. And then on that other plate going in the operation, we said, oh, uh, you want to talk about drugs? This is speech. We know everything about speech. We're going to scrutinize you. And so the basic question here is the following simple one of institutional design. Uh, do we follow the levels of relatively strict scrutiny that developed in connection with political dispensation speech, at which point uh, Coronia will become the first of many cases that will clip the wings of the FDA, or do we go back to the sort of police power 1930 models that Papa knows best, government knows best with respect to all these technical issues, at which point this case will fall to smithereens. Now, to put it in this way, let me just mention that when Abigail Alliance came up, there were two libertarian judges who essentially voted to strike down the FDA restrictions. Uh, a judge named Griffith dissented. Uh, the thing went on to the Circuit Court of Appeal on bank. Griffith came out of dissent, and the two winners could not pick up an additional vote. This case is eight or nine years later. I think the mood has shifted somewhat. I think the operation of the off-label market is mature enough. So I don't think you will get that kind of a repetition. But if you do, and this case is reversed, it will go to the Supreme Court. Because they've already taken cases in which drug companies are not allowed to use certain kinds of information for marketing, where the case, in my view, is much weaker for the First Amendment than here. And nonetheless, they have struck down various statutes. So I do think that this is an area where we're likely to see some market liberalization. In the 1843 issue of the Edinburgh Review, what the author said is that liberty of speech, and liberty of religion, and liberty of contract all stand and fall together. And anybody who seeks to divide them will, in fact, destroy the whole. That has always been my position. And my view is that perhaps if we get Coronia right and keep it in place, we may be able to get some much needed liberalization in other portions of the market. So let's have some questions. Thank you. Thank you, Richard. Now, I knew you were prolific, but I didn't realize you'd written for the 1843 Edinburgh Review. <laughs> well, actually, it's one of my favorite quotes, um, because those guys got it right. In a, an environment, I might add, in which there was no constitutional culture with judicial review, but only one of parliamentary supremacy. And yet, from the period starting in about 1840, running through about 1880, uh, England managed to keep itself on a relatively open market, laissez-faire governance structure. First change in attitude was actually the 1880 Employer Liability Act, um, which was then gutted by the courts happily. Uh, and it was only by, say, 1895 to 1900 that they flipped over and the difference in growth levels between the two period in England were quite stunning. Um, amazing what it is. The single most, you know, I don't know why we're talking about this, but the, I'm single, not. the <laughs> single most dangerous piece of legislation in England was the Trade Disputes Act of 1906, because what it did is it insulated unions from all of the laws of civil conspiracies and monopolies, which resulted essentially in the Thatcherite crisis some years later. So the Edinburgh Review stands, I think, for an extremely important set of propositions. And what's interesting about it is every modern constitutional scholar of most repute, I do not include myself as a reputable scholar for these purposes, believes that you can have two tiers. You can have preferred freedoms, and suspect classifications, and then you get ordinary freedoms and non-suspect classifications. You can then give a high-level review for the things that you care about and a low-level review for the things that you don't. You have embarrassing marginal questions, which you brush aside by a variety of stratagems. But what you never do when you take this approach is to rethink the system from the ground up as a systematic whole. And that's why the 1843 quote is so important. So back to 19, uh, 19 back to 2013. Oh. And right. the FDA. Yeah, I never heard uh, of those guys. Yet. I think I'm on the Livingston side of this argument, which probably won't surprise you. It doesn't. The old status come to Stanford, yes. Yeah, but <laughs> no, but um, you're here. Well, at the Hoover Institution, right? 
Which is at Stanford. Oh, but know. in any event, an um, enclave. two things, right. uh, and then I'll let other people, mm -hmm. if your response gives them any time, I'll let other people talk. Right. Uh, first, um, you talk about how the implications of Cronia could eviscerate FDA regulation, which I think is certainly right. Good, okay. Uh, but I think it could also go far beyond the FDA because almost every regulatory scheme has <coughs> limitations on speech as part of it, not just things like campaign finance, but things like the SEC, things like the NLRB. Wide variety of regulatory schemes could stand or fall with the Coronia decision, which I know makes you happy, but might give some members of the court, even those who are not all that enamored of the FDA, pause. Okay, let me answer it. Remember, I did not say that any speech is necessarily good. I said if the externality was positive, then the cooperation to achieve it should not be branded as a conspiracy. Now let's go back and look at the various ones of these things and see which they are. Start with the SEC. Um, sometimes the SEC is actually trying to stop misrepresentation, right? And when it does so, the conspiracy rules ought to kick in in order to enforce that. So Ponzi schemes and various kinds of wash scales and all the other things that were done will essentially be attacked. But on the other hand, as you also know, there are many serious limitations, for example, on the ability of individuals uh, to market products lawfully to audiences which are not pre-qualified by the SEC. So this crowdfinancing issue, which is now before us, says if you want to go out there to a bunch of Stanford nerds and sell them in $100 units, stock to buy your new particular device, you're subject to fraud, misuse, and, mis and abuse kinds of statutes, but you can do it. Right now, that's completely unlawful because of all the private offering rules. So what happens is we have to bifurcate the SEC, and the bad stuff goes, and the good stuff stays, and so I'm happy. Let's go back to labor law. All right? Now, the key provision in labor law is the section known as 8C, which was introduced into the National Labor Relations Act by the Toft-Hetley bill. And what it does is it starts to regulate in some kind of fashion the sort of speech that an employer can make against uh, an employee in the context of a union election. And it's a very odd statement because you're allowed to tell truth. But what you're not allowed to do is to either promise a benefit or to predict a harm because those things are now regarded as coercive. Within the framework of the National Labor Relations Act, strangely enough, that's actually the correct decision because you cannot run a collective bargaining system if, in fact, the employer, when faced by a union, goes to all the workers and says, forget about this character. I'll just give you all those benefits if only you'll get rid of that dastardly union and its dues and its crazy work rules. And the NLRA is organized around the proposition that collective bargaining is necessary. So what's my reaction to it? is I don't think you can strike down 8C given the current law. But I have been passionate opponent of the NLRA from the day in which it has been founded and think that the whole statute essentially legitimates cartels of the worst possible variety, which has caused unconscionable difficulties in both the public and private sector. And I would frankly overrule all of the 1937 decisions and go back to the 1915 rules with respect to freedom of contract. Although I would point out you were negative eight years old when it was founded, so you haven't been an opponent since the time it was founded. Well, let me, I will, I will accept that modification, but by the time I got to law school in 1966, and then I had a course with labor law with Harry Wellington, I regarded him as an able teacher who wanted to rearrange the deck chairs on the Titanic as it was sinking. And what do I mean by that? What he was, and this is true of the FDA types at the time, is we didn't think as lawyers about fundamental legal relations. What we thought about is how we implemented all these harebrained New Deal schemes. And so you'd have to worry about, in a very serious fashion, do you prefer the arbitration rules under Lincoln Mills? Do you prefer having these decisions done by the board? If the board does it, should it do it by adjudication or should it do it by rulemaking? Should we use arbitration instead? Et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Never once will we ask, does this system make any sense? And the basic proposition is this. Put aside for the moment the very serious issues of minority freeze-outs by dominant unions, which is an issue. A union is a dumb cartel. So what that means, in effect, is all cartels are less efficient than monopolies, 
And what they do is they have perverse distributional consequences amongst their ranks, and they impose massive distortions on the larger economy of which they're a part. And I can see no reason to defend it. And when I looked and I read Archibald Cox writing in 1957, explaining that unions were really libertarian organizations that advanced freedom from contract, it basically said, what is this man thinking? Um, it was terrible. Because what he meant was that there was perfect freedom of association of members to join a union, and then an employer would be under a duty to bargain with them whether it liked it or not. And if you really believe in freedom of association, it's not a worker right, it's not a management right, it's an individual right, and everybody should be entitled to walk away from everybody else, whether they're unified or whether they're not. So he perverted the notion in order to justify the scheme. So on that front, I'm going crazy. Which other one did you mention? You mentioned some other scheme. That well, you know, in the interest of letting somebody else ask a question, oh, I will I'm... just make a comment and then pass the baton. Oh, no, no. I don't think it's self-evident the weighing of the pluses and minuses that you reached in a world, as between a world where there's information about third party, about off-label uses collected and promoted by everyone except the drug company versus a world where the drug company can promote beyond the, sta the current safe harbors that they are allowed to promote in, if you look at those two comparisons, it's not self-evident to me that you are right, nor is it self-evident to me that you or I should be the ones to make the decision about which way that balance goes. Somebody goes. has to make it, and the last person to and make arguably this, Congress has no, made the it. last person to make any responsible decision is Congress. Um, and in fact, just to get the history right, Congress had no power to regulate the manufacture of drugs until 1938 because it was prohibited under the Commerce Clause to do so. And if you look at the 1905 Pure Food and Drug Act, uh, they could not regulate that. They could only regulate drug production in the territories because E.C. Knight was actually understood to stand what E.C. Knight stood for. You could regulate commerce but not manufacture. But this is my answer. If it were me and you, Hank, I'll yield to you every time. But there are hundreds and thousands of physicians and patients out there, and they have voted with their feet, and they disregard the stuff that the FDA puts out, and they take very seriously the stuff that other people put out. When I was in, I go to all the healthcare meetings at the University of Chicago through the Center of Clinical Medical Ethics, and you get somebody in the room, and you ask them, what do they think about the FDA? They say, it's not for public attribution, because there will be retribution against me or my firm. But the only debate that we have is whether or not it slows down the rate of medical practice by three years or five. You just don't hear anybody privately saying anything else, and the same people who say this privately would basically try to shoot you if you said it publicly because the danger of retaliation was such. So here's just a little story. When I was a young cub, younger than Hank is today, I represented the American Insurance Association. I went to a meeting with the then called Pharmaceutical Manufacturers of the United States, and they were talking about the FDA's reaction to beta blockers. So young Epstein, age 34, 35, gets up and says... Yeah, I'm 35, that's right. Thank yeah. you. They said, well, I looked at them and said, this guy's an incompetent, right? They said, complete. So why don't you denounce him publicly and force him out? He says, Professor Epstein, let me introduce you to the world of American politics. We denounce this guy. We may get him out. But we have 17 drugs that are now before the FDA. And every one of them will be deep-sixed in a thousand different ways if we decide to go after this man. Sir, you may do that, and I'm doing it right now. He says, but we prefer quiet diplomacy as the dominant form of action. And that's exactly correct. All the people who work inside the system play inside Beltway baseball. And so there was this panel I was on some years ago, about five years ago, where we were talking about some of these issues, and I was on a panel with three former FDA commissioners and one FDA general counsel. And when I was the host of the panel, each of them, in turn, took the opportunity to denounce me for my views, uh, because they all wanted to be reappointed to some kind of position in power, or they wanted to have clients who can deal with them. And I told them, I'm the only free man here. I don't have many clients. And in fact, every time I speak here, I lose the next possibility of getting <laughs> one. But it is important for you to understand just how tightly that web turns out to be. Ma'am, did you have a question? Uh, yeah. Now, how does that relate to Very good. Let me give you the microphone. Yeah. Oh, you're one of Hank's colleagues, huh? Um, how does it, that um, um, oh. ha relate to the um, drugs that are grandfathered in, in your opinion, like for instance, Timerosol. Uh, 
Oh, oh, Thimerosa wasn't grandfathered in. The grandfathering problem is actually extremely important. Um, but it's not important so much today. When you go back and you look at the 1962 Act, it did two things. We had thalidomide, which was clearly a safety problem. So what they did is they naturally decided to regulate effectiveness, which is not a safety problem, for which they're not very good at. But they also required that the FDA could remove drugs from the market, which had already been out there, unless they were retested in accordance with the standards for clinical trials that were used for new drugs. Now, this, in my mind, was a total disaster. Uh, one of the problems that you have with even good clinical trials is that the number of years that you have to observe the patients before the drug goes on the market is sharply limited. You've got patents which will be exhausted if you run it for the full time. And so what happens is once you get a drug on the market, you now get new information from domestic use, from physicians, and from foreign use. And so you may have had a drug on the market for 30 years coming on there. All of a sudden, the thing goes off the market if the FDA decides that it needs a new text. And hundreds of drugs were essentially taken off. Now, you again have the same question you had before. Which would I rather take on average for relatively rare, low volume conditions? A drug which has survived market use in the United States and overseas for many years, or one which has gone through three years of clinical testing which may prove to be imperfect? It's not the same for everything. Cholesterol is an easy drug to test for because you get very large samples and the side effects usually come up very soon. And just the other day, I think Merck pulled off another drug which turned out to have more damage and less good than otherwise. So this is not a per se denunciation of clinical trials. But when you get additional sources of information to then treat those as useless and to start the cycle over again is to my mind a terrible mistake. So the pharmacopoeia in many ways is deprived of some of its best type of methods precisely because of the consequences. And there's just one other irony I will add. What do you think happened to thalidomide? Well, I, I don't know what happened. Well, thalidomide is now on the market. Yeah. Thalidomide is called Thalmud, and it turns out it was first used to deal with leprosy. And then people discovered through this ad hoc method that it was of value in dealing with multiple myeloma. Uh, this was a big enough market that they actually ran and retested it for it. And so what they did, in effect, was to allow it on. And you know what? They still say pregnant women in their first trimester are well advised not to take thalidomide. So what happens is they made the wrong response. Um, what they should have said under those circumstances is a strong warning and controls over the distribution system so that pregnant women would not be exposed to it, and then try to figure out whether or not this thing would have had some valuable uses elsewhere. And by having the over-exclusion of the drug, it delayed the use of thalmud for valuable purposes by about 25 or 30 years, okay? So, I mean, it, it turns out that when you look at these kinds of things, there are always two kinds of errors. And the drugs are extremely complicated because, essentially, sometimes when they enter the body, they perturb the system in a healthy way, and sometimes they do it in a disastrous way. And you sometimes do not know which you're dealing with unless you could identify the subclass of yeah, cases exactly. to which it's applied. That's the reason why I'm asking the question, because uh, well, I've got disastrous effects to certain things that are not being recognized. I agree with that. And what happens is, if you actually check this, just as a, a kind of a point, what a, Jesus, one of the things that's worth asking is what percentage of drugs are pulled by companies before they have any kind of clinical trial? And it's a very large percentage because the data that comes out is very bad. There was one funny named drug having to do with cholesterol, which was a combined product by Pfizer. And they spent a billion plus dollars on tests. The results come in at 9 o'clock in the morning. And they discovered that all the synergies were negative instead of positive. The trial was closed and the drug was pulled from the market by noon that day. I mean, nobody would wait for an FDA trial. Could you imagine trying to go forward where the clinical studies are persuasive and say, here's a deathly drug that you can take? Um, it just doesn't happen. And it turns out that not only that, but if you thought these drug companies were all powerful, then whatever they decide to market, somebody's going to decide to buy. And it happens all the time that drugs are put on the market with great hopes and expectations. It turns out the long-term side effects are larger than people thought. The benefits are smaller than they thought. And what happens is these things are shut down. Now, you could have 20 of those and one Vioxx, right? 
And all the attention goes to Vioxx, and the truth about Vioxx is it should still be on the market today. At the very least, it is still known to be the best drug to deal with post-operative intestinal bleeding available. And when you take it off the market for prescription uses, there's no reason whatsoever to take it off for hospital uses. And it's just a classic illustration of a situation where the FDA believes in the meat cleaver because they don't spend enough time worrying about the information. The drug companies like Merck are frightened to death that if they leave it on the market, they will be essentially vilified for it. Of course, it didn't work anyhow. They got themselves sued. They won most of the cases, um, not all of them. Some of them that they lost were outrageous. The one in Angleton, Texas, which was reversed on appeal. And they basically settled this thing out for $5 billion. But as a nation, we are worse off by virtue of the fact that it is off the market. Because in fact, for many people, it's better than than celebrate. Although ironically, yeah. if we had stronger controls on off-label use so you could limit its use to a hospital situation where it makes sense, mm -hmm. then we could have an effective... No, but no, the point about it was, no, that's not right. Uh, the other uses were perfectly legitimate. They were not off-label uses. The, the charge against them was over-promotion. And in fact, it was over-promotion in my judgment. I mean, what they did in effect is they showed you pictures of folks taking Biox going into some verdant you know, glen, rejoicing in the fact that they're in a pain-free world, when in fact the data with respect to long-term use of Biox was very thin. It wasn't negative, it was thin. That is, the end got small, because as people started to drop off from the test, you just couldn't be confident enough of it. And they got them for that. Uh, it turns out that those are very complicated cases. The Angleton case, for example, was clear that the testimony was altered in some significant fashion between the time that the, the autopsy was written and the time that the plaintiff's lawyer, Mark Lanier, got to the witness. She changed the story as to what went on, which explained why it was reversed on appeal. Uh, my favorite Vioxx story is the woman who swears up and down that her husband took this Vioxx. And just to prove it, she showed the container which she had it in and the four that were removed and the 14 that were left. And so the Merck people take the container and they show that it was not put into the market until six months after the guy dies. Um, and then they don't dismiss the case for fraud. They allow her to prove this by other methods. She's clearly just made a mistake. No, I mean, I, I, you can go through this stuff, but the basic rule on an injunction is that you try to tailor it to get out the tumor and leave the healthy cells. And the basic rule, in my judgment, with respect to various kinds of FDA action should follow that principle. And that what you try to do is to figure out which of these uses you regard to be legitimate and then find a way to do it. Now, is there time for one more question? Yes, there may not be uh, time for one more answer, but there's time for uh, one more question. Yes. <laughs> more okay, so I, there are the two parts that the FDA does, and maybe Hank's question and, and your answer, um, trying to eviscerate sort of all the different agencies, answers it. But I'm just wondering, I mean, if you, you said that this would clip the wings of the FDA if you were to mm -hmm. were to expand the First Amendment. Um, but I don't see how you wouldn't shoot it down, because if off-label use is then allowed to be promoted, right, then all of a sudden people, the drug companies will be looking to only get approval for sort of the, the most extreme cases possible and then expand their market share through off-label use, right? So is that... Is that sort of an explicit part of your argument, or is that just a benefit? A no, I, I think it's actually, it's, first of all, it's a very important part of the discussion, one way or another. That is, what happens is, today, if you can find one indication for which a drug is approved, you could market it for everything, because you stop the blockade, um, which takes place when you ask for experimental use exemptions. And so there's no question that companies already take advantage of that situation and do so. But, I mean, in my view about it is the argument actually goes in the opposite direction. One drug that I know something about is a drug called Dexycline because I'm good friends with the fellow who tried to put it forward. And what happened is they ran a $323 million trial on this drug, one arm of which in France turned out to be defective in virtue of the fact uh, that uh, the people who administered it made some mistakes. And so what they did is they hired some fairly prominent biostatisticians indicate, given the large numbers of N they had, how they could stratify their samples in a multiple number of ways, which would allow them to continue to draw the inference that the drug was healthy. It was quite clear that nobody in the FDA understood the math that was being used, and so they said, you have to start over. Okay, well, now you start over, and you know, you don't have 
the population on which to test it. You don't have the $323 million in your portfolio or wallet in which to do it, so you abandon the market. Now, what then happened is this was a serious condition that you were worried about, melanoma and dementia, I think was the topic, and you then find that there's some guy who has a drug which is on the market for something else. And what they do is they see the similarity between their drug and the one that was killed, and they put it on for an off-label use, and they gain some degree of market traction. I don't remember how much. But the point in many ways is this. What the FDA should do over time is not figure out how to kill clinical trials, but given the fact that administrative errors, particularly when you have overseas arms of trials, how to minimize the bad influence of those things so as to get them on the market, because in fact, if you do have a drug which is improved, even if it's not perfect, you'd rather take a drug for which there's been explicit testing in larger numbers than an off-label use. And if you close down the new drugs coming up, you will increase the off-label use even more than it would otherwise be. So you just don't want to look at the strategic element of getting the one drug on a market, which you then use off-label uses. You want to recognize, in fact, that if you're really tough with new approvals, on-label uses will for the same condition will also be reduced, which will create the wrong kind of balance. So in general equilibrium, I don't think that that's the, the basic point. The other thing is the FDA, and nobody else to my mind, has actually done retrospective clinical studies on all label uses for a variety of conditions to actually sort out what's going on. And this is one of the things that happens when you have strong government control over information. People are very much reluctant to do independent studies for fear that that might get them into some kind of calculations or problems, misrepresentations, tort liabilities. So this thing continues as essentially an intellectual gray market, which is not ideal. And then you get some studies coming out, but it's not as many as you want. But I can say this, I am not aware, and maybe there's some docs in the room who can correct me, of any drug used extensively in off-label uses that has produced calamitous results. Erroneous results, everybody's going to have to live with, because that happens with all kinds of uses. So what happens is we're in a political equilibrium, currently. And now when this decision comes along, it's going to jolt it, I think, fairly substantially. My hope is that it will jolt it everywhere else in the free speech universe. But remember, I'm not, I'm not, this is not a charter member of Libertarians for Fraud. That's not my organization, right? And once you understand that you... The, the balance of information can flip over, and with it, every collateral choice ought to flip over as well. I think one ought to be less alarmist about the way in which you look at this topic. Okay, one more question, ma'am. Uh, I'm willing to go as long as you are. I know. Oh, really? Well, we can't go much longer. <laughs> for, for reasons and others, but... All right, yeah, well, we can knock it at the door. Let's go two more. I gave the microphone over there, and then... Okay. Well, here. This may not actually be a question. I'm a uh, retired physician, mm -hmm. and I uh, just have this uh, scandalous magazine called the New England Journal of Medicine. It is scandalous. And I well, just happened to be reading it. Why, I don't know. And of course, there's a letter from uh, a group in Australia mm -hmm. which was able to get compassionate use for a drug which has been on the market ever since I retired uh, called Bortezomib, which is used in multiple myeloma. And they had a, a very rare hematologic condition, and they, in the last ditch effort, succeeded in uh, getting a remission in this disorder. Mm -hmm. Now, my understanding would be that a drug company should not uh, disseminate this kind of information to physicians. That's correct. And I think this is absolutely critical because you have a very uh, uh, good public information. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, you know, you suffer from the incurable illness of being a naive libertarian. And we should only have more judges who had that particular affliction. Because you don't see the reason why it is that the suppression of truthful information that will help other people should be stopped in virtue of the fact that we could identify who's supplying. And there's a kind of a constant populist undertone. Drug companies are in it for the profit. The only way they could get profit is essentially to rip off their customers so that all the reputational constraints that otherwise exist are think to matter very little. Yes? Um, well, two things. To give you an example of a drug that um, is used for off-label uses that had pretty terrible consequences, hormone replacement therapy uh, for, for women um, after menopause 
increased the risk of breast cancer, they found later. Um, another... Okay, okay, I'm going to comment on that, because I don't think that's an accurate account. Okay. Um, I'm, my question would be more about, you, you sort of disregarded the monopoly issue um, very quickly, and I was just wondering if you could provide uh, your thoughts on that a, a little bit further shortly, I guess, uh, for the time, especially considering that physicians seem to have a monopoly over prescription drugs in, dis in dissemination of the drugs, okay. where you can't get a drug without okay, it. Okay, we understand that. And let me start taking the first one. First, with respect to hormone replacement therapy, they were not good studies. And the reason they were not good studies is it was zero one. And my wife is one of the eligibles in that. And I said, she showed me the studies, and I said, what should I do? And I said, well, you should try to think about half. And I said, well, why half, she says. Because you may be able to get 70% of the benefits at 20% of the risk. And so if you're trying to do this when the government says do or don't, uses existing dosages or no dosages, it's doing a public disservice by getting rid of all the intermediate alternatives. Second mistake in the argument, yes, it did show an increase in breast cancer, but it also showed a reduction in other kinds of complications. I don't remember whether it was heart disease or bowel disorder, whatever it is. And you can't run these studies by looking at one outcome off of one pill. You have to take into account the full suite so as to make a kind of comprehensive lifetime morbidity, uh, mortality type of arrangement. So I think that that's hard. Secondly, the argument about um, prescription drugs you use the word monopoly, it's a dangerous word. Um, because what happens is, it's not as though there's only one physician who has the power to dispense. It's a whole variety of physicians that have a power to dispense. And the argument can actually be put, I think, in reverse. Uh, what happens is there are many drugs, <coughs> like cancer drugs, which if you dispense them over the counter, <coughs> would probably result in the death of many innocent people. Um, I don't care about the fact that they're restricted because no sane person wants to take them without medical supervision anyhow. And if you keep them out of general circulation, they may not fall into the hands of naives who would do something very dangerous. But if, in fact, you do have physician control, like you did in the Abigail Alliance situation, that's a very strong argument for saying you don't need to have FDA control because you've got a better gatekeeper. What's the difference between the two of them? Well, the FDA essentially can only work on generic properties and cannot take into account variations based upon individual patient condition. You as a doctor can look at the generics, take into account the particulars, and decide, for example, in a very simple way, what are the risk factors. So when it comes to hormone replacement therapy, if you think that breast cancer in a mother's parents, a father or mother, makes a difference, you would say, you better go down to a quarter or not at all. And to somebody else say, you got a clean history, you can do more. The FDA cannot do that. And so this is an argument in favor of non downstream in individuation as opposed to upstream control. And it's an important problem because the variance in response to drugs across patients, as you know, is really quite profound. And there are some people who do better on Celebrex than they do on Vioxx. There's some people who may do better if you switch back and forth between them for whatever reasons, because the cumulative negatives of one drug may not be present in the other. So instead of going up and up and up, you go up, you stop, you start at the beginning and so forth. You know all that stuff. Tell me. Um, let me ask you the following question. Is not dosing one of the signs of the difference between a good physician and a not-so-good physician? Position? It has to be. How much you give, when you give it, what you combine it with. The FDA can't do any of that stuff. Even the advisory bodies can only give you parameters, but they can't do it. And so this is an argument for releasing the power of the FDA, not for strengthening it. Yes, sir, did you have a Last question? question. All right. Not really a question, but more of a comment, and it addresses uh, the concern that was raised about a, a pharmaceutical company getting an approval for one indication and then yeah. being able to sell it for yeah. many. And the problem is reimbursement. So almost without exception, uh, insurers, both private and public, will reimburse for approved indications. But in indications that aren't approved, in essence, will only be re reimbursed for if the indication is listed in one of the three uh, independent co compendia yeah. that exist in this country. Yeah. And those, in turn, those listings only occur on the basis of well-controlled clinical studies uh, and scientific information that these independent bodies view uh, as sufficient enough to cause them to be listed. Typically, it's at least three uh, independent clinical studies that are required. So even if a pharmaceutical, pharmaceutical company wanted to promote, promote a product for an unapproved use, if it's not supported by a compendia list, it isn't going to get reimbursed typically. Yeah, now, look, I would disagree with that on only one particular, 
which is the question as to whether or not the clinical trials are strictly required and what that actually entails. It may well be that what happens is you get sort of random use, then you get somebody who puts together a piece in the New England Journal of Medicine. I take it when you're talking about these studies for the compendium, foreign studies will count as well as domestic studies, so they don't have to be under FDA approval and so forth. Um, you can take a clinical study intended to test for one thing and reinterpret it for another with respect to these devices, which you can't do with respect to the FDA. So it is that way, but this is the, the, another way to put the same point is that, you know, just because off-label uses are going to be allowed, it doesn't mean that everybody's going to use it for an off-label use. And what you have to do in order to get the eligibility is to go through a set of professionals on whom other people will start to rely. And if they think three clinical trials are appropriate, my reaction to them is, God bless you. And if they think in certain cases, as I'm sure is, if the alternatives are very bad and you have some preconditions and there's nothing else better, then they tell you that and they may say, look, uh, you're reducing your chances of death from 95 to 92 percent. Don't treat this as though it's the magic bullet of Paul Ehrlich. And you can start to do that. But the point is you could actually qualify and quantify the levels of improvement. And I don't believe if you have any drug which has a higher risk and a lower rate of return that you're going to find any voluntary organization that will sanction. It will be a dominant drug. But in most of the cases, you have to segment the population, and simple cases of clear dominance are generally not available. Okay, on that note, thank you. Thank you very much, Richard. Yeah.